nós temos aqui hoje o prazer de receber o Dr. Randoman, né, que é da Universidade Livre de, de Amsterdã, na Holanda. O Dr. Randoman é um colaborador nosso, ele está aqui é, por conta de um projeto de Ciências Sem Fronteiras, e tem a participação também do Dr. Celso Von Randall, que também está aqui, que é do CCST. Então, para nós é um grande prazer recebê-lo aqui. E ele gentilmente aceitou o nosso convite para proferir a palestra aqui no CPT. Então, welcome here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giva. As usual, it's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Cachoeira, uh, at CPTEC in particular. Uh, as Giva has said, um, I'm here on a Science Without Borders uh, fellowship. I was here at CCSD two previous times, and this is At the moment, it's my last time, but I'm sure it's not my last time in Brazil. Um, so I, I will tell you something about the work that we did in uh, Amsterdam and something that Celso and I did over the last few weeks. So just everybody knows this graph about the, the water cycle. Um, the thing that interests me most at the, at the moment is, is not so much this real big sum here, but the variability of that and how it behaves with this massive flux that comes from the ocean. So it's very much the interaction between the ocean moisture here and rainfall and subsequent evaporation on the land that I will be, will be talking about. So water and the climate system, uh, a few things about water. Uh, it's due to water that we have a habitable planet that we are here anyway. Um, and we're very strongly dependent on this uh, for our food supply, but also for our nature uh, and other uh, issues. From a scientific perspective, it's the water and the carbon cycle that are coupled. And so the amount of carbon that is released from vegetation or is being taken up by vegetation is very strongly dependent on water as well. And at the land surface, soil moisture is critical in regulating uh, the fluxes of energy into latent and, and sensible heat. So if you, if you sum that all up, water regulates to a large extent climate change by feedbacks, feedbacks of evaporation, atmospheric water vapor, the way clouds are building up and subsequent runoff is being uh, prepared. Now one of the things that I was here for is this, this graph of a number of what we call critical uh, tipping points in the Earth system. And this shows the relative likelihood and the relative impact. So um, anything to do with ice sheet collapse has a very big impact because it raises sea level uh, dramatically. But the, the likelihood is still somewhat lower. And the Amazon rainforest dieback story is somewhere in, in the middle of that. We don't quite know, I think, what's going to happen to that and whether there's a high likelihood and what the real global impact of that will be as well. So one of the questions here is, do our Earth system models do well in this context? Can they, can they be useful uh, as a, to help? Uh, but also, whether we have stable or alternative states and what recovery times are required. I mean, that's a very important question. Uh, if you do something, do you have enough time to adapt, but also do you have enough time to try and improve the resilience so that it will get back to its original state? That's why these two things are, are quite important. So that, that's something more of the background uh, I want to talk about. So coming back to, to water, uh, one of the, the big questions is, is the hydrological cycle accelerating? That's an, a very old question, but to some extent from first principles, warmer, you would expect that to happen, more rainfall, more evaporation. That's very hard to detect from the current data, particularly precipitation. Surface temperature increases are a lot more easy to determine than uh, Uh, but also, are extreme events changing? That's an important uh, question because that's, those are the ones that cause the most damage uh, to society, the impact of human activities. And I think one of the key questions in the global water budget 
as is in the global energy budget, and to some extent also in the global carbon budget, is can we close the cycle? Do we have enough information to know exactly at a level where it's important, so at the regional level, for instance, uh, the amount of precipitation falling on the land, the amount of evaporation, the amount of runoff, replenishment of groundwater, so that we really have a closed budget. And that's, I think, still one of the key questions. For the global water budget, that, on the basis of observations, is still not done. And when you do that on the basis of observations, satellite observations usually, uh, for energy, that's also still an issue. But I think we don't really stand a chance in understanding climate change and predicting climate change if we can't really get there. So, uh, this is my view of the, the water cycle. Uh, evaporation from the ocean going up, falling back, inflow onto the land, but there's also recycling happening here and affecting the soil moisture and the discharge going back. So all these terms, all these fluxes, all those stores, you need to know if you really want to have to go and close in the, uh, the Earth water budget. So I'll show you some examples of how we did some of that work, and I won't attempt to close the, uh, the water budget here, so don't, uh, don't expect that by the end you'll get an estimate of how, what the residual is that we don't know. Um, I'll just show you some examples that are part of this. So one of, one of those examples is looking at the interaction of soil moisture uh, and heat, particular heat waves. I mentioned the extremes already. So if you look at temperature and precipitation, you find that there are a series of feedbacks that can amplify uh, specific situations. Particularly if you look at the precipitation, if you have less precipitation, you put less uh, moisture in the soil store and you introduce less evaporation, so you have in principle less uh, moisture to evaporate. That's sort of basic understanding. That's to some extent how a lot of the models do this. Similarly with heat, heat waves, you can have temperature increases when evaporation decreases. So there is a link between, and that's something that I will come back to at the end, there's a link between things like evaporation, temperature increase, and precipitation. That's important uh, to remember. And there are various ways of the way these feedbacks will even walking back to the my laptop, and I don't have to do that. So I'll, I'll take a different perspective now. Uh, we, it's when you when you try to assess the feedbacks, it, it, it's important, I think, to realise that there are very different processes working at very different time scales. Particularly when you're interested in the the, the role of things like ocean uh, temperatures uh, on things like winter precipitation, because we, we know that a lack of winter precipitation in Europe can lead to uh, heat waves further down. If we don't have enough soil moisture in the store and all that evaporates in the spring, then we can have a very dry summer and a very hot summer. That's something that happened in 2003. And I think about 30,000 uh, people died, most of them French, for those who still uh, <laughs> soak about the match yesterday. Um, the, one of the things that we did was to, to use um, to look at the, the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation and particularly at the mean temperature pattern and the maximum temperature pattern and try and relate that to uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation. And what you see here is the percentage forced uh, by, uh, by this oscillation. What you see that you see some variability in, in the mean, particularly in the southern areas here, but you also see something in here, which is the maximum of the temperature that's being forced. And that is really something that creates the end result of a heat wave. And that was, this was also the, re, the, the area where the 2003 heat wave happened. So looking at the patterns of variability within the ocean and the patterns of temperature variability in the land at the longer time scale, so the decadal time scale, gives you some insight in the longer term forcing. But that's only one, one story. You go to the next, and we look at 2003 again. Remember, 
that big place. So this is in July. This is the, the coloring is temperature versus some sort of index related to uh, the sensible heat, which makes sense because if the temperature is high, you tend to have a large amount of sensible sensible heat input. And this is this is the area where the heat wave was really really strong, and particularly between the first weeks of August, so where you see that. And what effectively happens here, you have these long-term forcing within the winter precipitation that is to some extent related to this long-term decadal forcing. And in the real execution almost of the heat wave, you see that there's a very large buildup here in this particular time of heat. And that is related to the fact that the boundary layer absorbs, absorbs this heat, so you get a higher boundary layer. Uh, it doesn't grow in proportion to the heat, but it stores more and more heat. Uh, and it, it, in effect, it sort of feedbacks and creates the conditions where the heat waves is much stronger uh, than other ones. So it's, it's the link between the drying out here in the soil and the accumulation of heat in the boundary layer. And if you put that in the sort of the classic feedback diagrams, you, you, you get this rather complicated thing where Things like entrainment uh, here at the top of the boundary layer play a role, and the input from the, the surface and how stable boundary layers in the field are. But if you look at the individual cases, you need to go back to the real physics at a relatively small vertical scale and a small spatial scale. But if you look at the larger scale forcing, indeed, something what you see is, is the sort of spatial scale there. We find places like uh, here in, in France where the, the real heat is concentrated. So, but it fits. So, long and short term are really uh, amplifying each other. One of the things that we used in this exercise is uh, a model called uh, Gleam, which is a evaporation model. Um, it does some interception, which are based on a very simple daily interception model. And it uses only satellite data. So there is no input from assimilation centers of uh, NSEP or ECW map. It's just straightforward satellite data that we use. In the, the thing here with the lightning climatology um, allows us to distinguish between convective rainfall and frontal rainfall. So if we have lightning, we consider it convective rainfall. And that has implications for the, the way the canopy wets up and how it subsequently evaporates back the, the moisture into the atmosphere. If we don't have lightning, we consider it frontal rainfall, and there's a small drizzle that's slowly filling up the, uh, the canopy store. This shows you the different estimates of uh, transpiration globally, with the, the Amazon being very high here. This is the latitudinal uh, plot in millimeters per year, and this is in uh, cubic kilometers uh, per year. Interception. This was, in fact, the first sort of semi-observational based estimate of global interception loss that uh, that was produced. Before that, we only had site estimates and our models produced interception. And we have bare soil evaporation and a little bit of snow uh, sublimation. This is what I said. So, uh, 460 millimeters of total uh, evaporation uh, is what we have, roughly 60% of uh, precipitation, uh, and roughly 6% globally is interception. But you see on these forested areas here, and in these forested areas there, we have a much larger interception loss. This is in percentage of the precipitation. So uh, in the Amazon rainforest, we estimate it's about 10 to 15% on average, which seems to fit with some of the observations, whereas in the sort of more temperate forest, we have higher interception losses, uh, up to 20, 30%. The nice thing is that you can corroborate that, those estimates. And uh, Leshenko and, uh, and others were using uh, water isotopes, 18O and uh, deuterium isotopes, to collect in particular lakes all the catchment areas where 
the runoff was, was coming from. And they also found that about 80% of total evaporation is made up of transpiration, which is very similar to uh, our estimates. So two independent estimates giving roughly uh, the same numbers. Now coming back to, uh, to this, that, as I said, accelerating the hydrological cycle implies that we have an increase in evaporation. And there was a paper published in 2000, then 2011, which sort of suggested that that increase, at least over the last 10 years, was not happening. So we looked in more detail uh, what was occurring there. So this is the global anomaly using that GLEAM model from 82 to 2010. And that paper was published around here, so at this point, where you could, could suggest that there is some sort of flattening of, of the curve. Now, what really happens is the following. So if you look in a bit more detail, um, in the northern latitudes, this is the line that you would expect evaporation to increase given the increase in surface temperature. So you use Clausius clubirion, and that follows. So that, that basically what we see at the northern hemisphere, it follows physics, which is always some sort of a comforting thought. If you look at the southern hemisphere, it also follows physics, but it's a slightly different one. The, the, the overall doesn't really have a trend, but it's very much related to the Southern Oscillation Index, the El Nino. We have very dry years where we have low soil moisture, low evaporation, and we have La Nina years where there's a lot of soil moisture and precipitation and high evaporation. And that determines very much the trend in the Southern Hemisphere. And if you look at the period that we're looking at here, you see that in the Northern Hemisphere, we have our increase, the blue one, and at the Southern Hemisphere, we have our decrease. And that decrease is very much related to these areas in, uh, in Africa, the Amazon. We, look, we did some further looks at looking at the evaporation and the soil moisture and contrasting El Nino versus La Nina years. And if you just follow the spots here, you see them turning from blue where there is an excess in El Nino to red in, uh, in La Nina years. So these are the, the hot spots of the evaporation distribution that, that we will see. Now, it's interesting to see how good these models are. Uh, we think, of course, that this one is the best. Um, but if you take two other ones, you get rather completely different partitioning. Um, this one seems to think that 50% of the total evaporation is soil evaporation and only 25% roughly uh, transpiration. Uh, if you look at this, it seems to get the interception roughly uh, a little bit more than, than what we have, um, the transpiration potentially less. And if you plot these on a curve like this, uh, different estimates, you see that, yes, we sort of have now global sets of evaporation, but they are, you have to be very careful which one you use or you use the ensemble, or you use the average, uh, uh, but there is pretty big variability in them. This is transpiration, soil evaporation, and interception for these different models. In the, in the new bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, the state of the climate, uh, that comes out every year and gives an update on changes in the US climate system, um, there is a, a small contribution on these evaporation estimates what's on from that, uh, taken from that. <coughs> As I mentioned, one of the key things is to understand where the water is coming from. So uh, if you're interested in this area here, is the water coming from an ocean source? Is it recycling over the land? Or is it coming from a different area uh, from the land? If you know that, you can determine the sensitivity of some of these areas to changes in input uh, or in changes in uh, ocean uh, circulation. We originally thought that ocean was the real driver because when we plotted the land evaporation 
Uh, with the ocean evaporation, we saw very large similarities, uh, largely because you have the same uh, El Nino, La Nina pattern in the, in the ocean as well. Of course. So uh, we were sort of biased towards thinking that, okay, this is the really important part. That explains to some extent why we did this study the way we did we did it. Um, you can you can do this in various ways. Uh, 2012, there was a paper by Arrow which sort of used uh, reanalysis data to determine the inflow into the Amazon basin, how much actually got down towards the south. I understand this is a big issue with the uh, the drought in uh, in Sao Paulo. Um, and this was done using a Eulerian uh, grid. So what we were trying to do is use a Lagrangian way of doing this, where we follow the particles um, and where they eventually precipitate. So we use FlexPart, which is a, a model that allows you to, to simulate this part based on uh, attraction data. And we apply that to an extreme event in Beijing. Uh, in China. Sorry, this is not the Amazon, but we're now talking uh, China. This is a Chinese PhD student. Put it this way. Um, in that 21-7 event is a well-known event in, in Beijing in 2012 with over 200 millimeters in 24 hours. So when we started doing this, we thought, okay, this has to be an atmospheric river. This has to be one of these supply chains that really put massive amounts of water into it. Uh, and to some extent, that's true. What you see here are the, the, the wet. These are all back to track trees uh, for a few days. And the blue ones are the, wet, the wetter ones. So these come from the Bay of Bengal. They have a fairly complicated way of, uh, of arriving there. These are all back to track trees which don't contain much moisture. So they don't really play uh, a lot of time. So about 70% of the moisture comes from the Bay of Bengal. But it's, it's the sort of classic definition that you use for uh, an atmospheric river. It uh, doesn't really apply. But you see that in, in one way, most of the moisture comes from the Bay of We then use the same system also to backtrack um, the, the, the sources of moisture for the, uh, the whole period. So this is a four-year period. Um, I think this is the summer with not an awful lot of rainfall. Where it's blue, it's a sink of water vapor, so it's a, it's a rainfall area. And where it's red, uh, it's a source. And what you see here, if you go two days before in the area, you go four days, eight days, and ten days, you see that most of the moisture is coming from these areas uh, here and from the Arabian uh, Peninsula. This is the summer, so there's not an awful lot of rainfall there. If you look at the winter, when you really have the rainfall, you can see these different bands in coming here and seeing that there's a lot of rainfall falling in these areas. You can see that in the second day, fourth day, and the eighth day progressing. So the flex part model really allows us to determine where the water is coming from and also look at individual events uh, like the, uh, the 21 7. Using that, you can see how much moisture inflow we have in the winter. So the big chain is coming from the Siberian area, but that flow hardly contains any water vapor. So a lot of the models that are based on the, on the standard Eulerian approach assume that most of the moisture really comes from these things because that's the dominant flow pattern. Whereas in, in fact, there's just these little Wrinkles here that determine so much during the day. So this is the winter to try. See, I was wrong previously. This is what happens in the summer. So when you have the real monsoon, and you see this big southwest monsoon chain coming up here, and this one here from the Bay of Bengal. So by, by selecting different areas, you were able to see where the water was really coming from, and uh, also then implying what would happen if there were changes in these different basins uh, in the future. I'll skip this. This basically tells you the same story that you can have a large inflow of moisture, um, but if you don't really have large amounts of specific humidity, 
you can't precipitate the stuff. So you need positive precipitation efficiency with relatively large humidity and stuff in tributary. We also use the flex part model in a slightly different way. Um, and that is to determine for these dry areas where the water is coming from. I remember that I told you that we were biased towards thinking that the ocean was very important. In this. And so what we first did was we used uh, a product that gives you basically vegetation density from a microwave uh, sensor. It's called vegetation optical density. And we selected the month with the highest biomass density and correlated that with precipitation. So the month of the climatological maximum, that given here, these are uh, different months. So you generally find that in the January, February, March period, we have the highest biomass in the Southern Hemisphere and the other way around in the Northern Hemisphere. We correlate that with precipitation. We get a correlation map like that. And we identify these areas as being dry and very dependent on precipitation input. And the next question is, if they are dependent on precipitation input, where is the water coming from? And is there a difference in the dry and wet season? So this, this plot again, what you see here is the precipitation. The blue one is the precipitation of oceanic origin. Um, yellow one outside the reason and the red one uh, recycled. So we expected the blue one to be very important. The blue one is important in this particular area. And there's a relatively large difference between the wet and the dry uh, part. And there are some areas where the red is important, so where the recycling uh, is important. And we then tried to look at whether there's a difference in the wet and dry in the source areas of the oceanic uh, region between wet and dry seasons. And you basically don't see much difference. The source areas in the wet and dry tend to be very similar. So that, that's not changing the amount of precipitation uh, and subsequent evaporation in, the, in these areas. So what happens in the end, it's a relatively complex picture where circulation patterns being important Evaporation being important, particularly in areas where we have recycling. That's the first part where I, I started my talk with. And also something that we think is atmospheric stability and its effect related to something more like convection potential. You can have a lot of moisture, but if you don't have the convection bringing it up to higher levels where it can start to precipitate, you still have no rainfall. So it's a complex story. Uh, if you look at the circulation upwind and stability change for these different areas uh, that are important. And this is, in a way, we originally were very, well, not, I wouldn't say depressed, but we thought, well, this is not really the story we'd like to tell. This, this is not a clear cut answer. But what it really tells you is if you, if you start thinking about management of droughts, it is quite important to realize where the sources of your droughts come from, and where the water causing these droughts and the lack of moisture in the soil is coming from. So rather than taking the global picture, oh, it has to be recycling, so it will probably be related to the evaporation. That's not the case. There are cases where it's just the ocean that is important. And there are cases where it's just the land that is important. But there is no real simple way of determining which is the most important for all of them. So this is basically what I, I said. And that the importance of local evaporation becomes very important when you have really dry climate. So that makes sense. So that only happens in areas where, you, where the, uh, the recycling is important. So now I'll finish off with the work that we did with Celso Juva and with Guillermo Martins. And that's basically related to the performance of uh, theme of five models to predict rainfall in the Amazon. So we did an analysis using these different boxes and using the different forcings from the Nino 3-4 uh, 
uh, surface temperatures and the North Atlantic and South Atlantic temperature uh, particularly the gradient. This just shows you that some of the importance in the different boxes uh, changes uh, uh, with the season, June, July, August, uh, December, January, uh, February. But this is all to some extent, these are things that we knew. Not, not an awful lot of difficulty there. This is a bit more worrying. Um, if you look at precipitation, evaporation, and convergence, and convergence we take here from the European uh, Central Reanalysis, you see that there's a very big divergence in the models between in precipitation, uh, also in evaporation, and they particularly tend to get it wrong in the dry season with some model just producing no rain at all in the dry season and under predicting here as well. So on average they turn out to be sort of all, all right, uh, but if you really look at the patterns they're not really there. The convergence precipitation numbers 30 percent uh, in the dry period underestimate and about 15 percent in the rainy season and convergence is also much larger. So we found that there's a higher bias up here and a lower bias of the models uh, there, and that's the summer period. And in the winter period, it's completely uh, reversed. And we don't exactly know what the models do and what causes this. This is one thing that we still have to sort of think about a bit more carefully with the, uh, with the paper that we're preparing. Now, one of the ways to look at this is try and find an emerging constraint. Emerging constraints is a sort of new tool in this game where you use observations. This is from uh, a paper by Peter Fox in 2013 and it gives you the, the sensitivity <coughs> of the climate to a change in the biomass per degree uh, change of Kelvin. This is not an example that I really want to show key things to remember from this is that if you plot numerous models on a line and you find the interannual variability, so the variability between each year, and plot that against the model behavior you find here, uh, that they are on a straight line and that the real observations are somewhat narrowed down. If you, if you apply that, this is the would then be the probability distribution function of the C4 MIP models. So this is the previous set of models that we could use. So a very wide range and a large uncertainty. That's basically the story. And if you apply that constraint, you get a much tighter fit to your probability distribution. So you have a much better estimate. So this is the sort of pompous way that this is being described. A model derived relationships converts observations to a constraint on the size of a feedback. And emergent constraints use the Earth system models, but they also use the observations. So it's a mix between the two. So we try to do that now with uh, precipitation. And what we look at is the following. Um, this is a plot of, I think, 20 or so uh, deforestation experiments. And they all plot they'll give change in surface temperature and change in precipitation. This is from models, the earliest deforestation models in the 90s. Up to now. So it's a very wide range of complexity of models that we've seen. There. But there's not much relation in there. You would expect, however, that there is some sort of relation between the surface temperature. Here, this is the surface energy balance. This is the radiation term. This is evaporation and the atmospheric moisture balance because they are coupled through evaporation. So if you assume just as a thought experiment, for instance, that there is no convergence in the basin and you don't have any runoff, effectively you derive an equation where the temperature is related to the precipitation here in some way. Whatever that way is, we don't know. But it's a made sense to try and look at whether we could find something in there. So this is 
from the crew database observation, surface temperature, and this is precipitation. And if you look at them already in these <coughs> variabilities, you see that when the surface temperature goes down, precipitation goes up, and the other way around. If you plot those as anomalies, you basically have a straight fit. So the cooler, cooler Amazonian climate, larger amounts of rainfall, and hotter, less rainfall, which is what you would think if you follow the classic story about evaporation, drought, and all these other things. Now, the nice thing is that if you plot the same thing for the CMIP-5 models, and the 21 models of these, for each of these models, you can plot the average surface temperature against the average precipitation, and they also follow a straight line. And these, these lines, they are sort of with p-values below uh, 100 or 1,000. So they are significant uh, lines. Now, what you can do next is for, this is, this is one model, that's another model, that's another model, that's another model, that's another model. For each of these models, you can look at the interannual variability, like in this graph here, and make a graph of this and derive the slope. The slope is the sensitivity of precipitation for a change in surface temperature, so dp, dt. So we calculated 21 slopes for each of these models. This is the, essentially the same, the same graph, the anomalies of the models and the observed anomalies. So we, we then have 21 slopes, which we calculated. We can plot them against the surface temperature. We know the observed variability of the surface temperature, which was smaller see that here already, is smaller in the observations than it is in the models. The models have a much wider range of surface temperature than the observations have. So this gives a constraint here. This is the observed value derived from the interannual variability of that sensitivity, so dp over dt. Now we can do some plot the probability distribution of these points here. That is this broken line. And then we can apply the knowledge that we have here from the surface temperature observed anomaly to derive a new probability distribution for this sensitivity, which is much sharper compared to the, to the original set of models, not the observation, um, and gives us a nice bright line. And it's closer to the observations that we derive from the this here, I plotted for Jura. These are the deforestation experiments that I showed you earlier. It's just the average of the deforestation experiments. If we plot the real ones, it's a, it's a fairly widespread, but the average seems to convert to this. Uh, draw. So we, we can derive a constraint on the rainfall sensitivity for the Amazon using observations. You can do that for the winter and the summer period. So October, November, December, uh, you see that the constraint is actually lowering much more. And in the dry season, it's, it's a bit closer to the, uh, the observation and reducing the spread. But in the dry season, there's a much wider range of model behavior. You see that this, this probability distribution is really stretched out in the dry season. And the dry season was really the case where the model had the, the largest problem. So, we find a relation between surface temperature and rainfall. Um, we can derive a constraint on that. And that constraint reduces the uncertainty in the model behavior by a factor, I think, 2 to 5, depending on which season uh, you look at. So we use the, the, the nice thing about this is that we use the information from the model. We don't say, well, the models are two standard deviations away from the observation, so we discard them. 
No, we continue to use the ensemble and we use the constraints of the observation. And the next thing we need to do is um, check that we didn't make any stupid mistakes. Um, try and see whether how we can relate this to some deforestation experiments. And we were just discussing with Giovanni also to use some of the CPTEC uh, model predictions to see whether we can do this. Uh, and, and constrain the future predictions with this constraint that we found. So that's the nice thing you can do. Once you have the constraint, you can sort of recalibrate, as it were, the future uh, predictions of the model. So that's what we're going to do next. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. So, Questions. Uh, I I know you you also try to relate though the, the precipitation with different variables there, uh, like uh, evaporation or. But there was this this uh, paper on uh, by Boisier mm -hmm. that relates with the the surface pressure. I mean there there's some. They, they show some relation between the precipitation yeah. and surface pressure. Uh, did you, did you, did you try that? And do 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 we see something like that also, or w with with pressure as a constraint? Uh, no, because I, I I think what they did, um, if I put it a bit sort of uh, bluntly, uh, was that. They, they did nothing really more than just use, uh, do some sort of a multiple regression on forcing variables. And so they, they had things like surface temperature, they had, they, they did use surface temperature, sorry, they, but they did use ocean uh, surface temperature. And so they, they, they did the sort of classic analysis of the forcing factors for Amazonian precipitation put that in a model, and then run that model to sort of scale back the model estimates of precipitation. So they don't really use the, the information that is in the CMIP-5 model. I mean, they, they, they use the, the relations that they found in there. And what we have here is, I, I, because surface temperature is more of a it's more of a diagnostic variable of the of the energy balance. I think that's that's the reason I think why it works. And it, it surface temperature as such doesn't predict precipitation. But when you have a lot of precipitation, the surface temperature will go down. So there is there is a, a, a correlation between the two. And I think the Boisier paper tried to uh, to use the sort of classic uh, degrees that I showed in, in, the, in the graph of Guilherme, uh, is uh, with these ones. They basically, basically use this type of information, is a surface temperature to, to predict. And rather than using the surface temperature of the north to south Atlantic gradient, which is the key thing, they, they used uh, something like pressure. And they, I, I, I think it was a bit sort of um, more like a quick and dirty way of, of calibrating the CMS 5 model. But I can say that because why is not here and really the ice is not in the audience. <laughs> so maybe he's watching me. <laughs> I wonder if you could um, uh, elaborate on soil moisture memory. When we, when we initialize uh, our atmospheric model with, um, for seasonal prediction, <clears throat> uh, we know that soil moisture may impact uh, predictability of the following months. And uh, I wonder if, if you could uh, elaborate whether or the South America, for instance, in which 
we have a relatively narrow continental area surrounded by oceans, if you would expect soil moisture initialization as being a key factor. And if, if so, by not initializing soil moisture as we do, how, how long do you think the system can capture, keep the memory that we, we had an imbalanced soil moisture at the beginning? Um, we, we, we did some, some studies with soil moisture initialization uh, in Europe on the 2003 uh, drought and, and looked at whether there was a difference if we used the European Center model in a, in a high resolution climate model or whether we used observed soil moisture from microwave. Um, and we did notice an effect, particularly on temperature, less on, on moisture. So, um, we haven't done that for Latin America, so I, uh, what I'm going to say is guesswork. Um, in, in dry areas, I, th I think the sort of average length of the soil moisture, uh, soil moisture vegetation feedback anyway, is about three months. That's the memory of the system. Uh, because that, it, it relates to short-term memory and say the complete drying out of the soil that generates uh, uh, evaporation. So the unfortunate part is also that we don't have reliable satellite soil moisture for the Amazon because all the microwave stuff just uh, saturates over the, over the forest. Um, in the other areas that have less dense vegetation, you could use that in drying. Like it, I don't think in, in what we find with this this emergent constraint is that, that there must be some relation also in the in the forest because we, we basically look at the Amazon forest in that area. Um, but you could yeah you would have the same sort of memory scale like like three months probably that that you have to deal with. Uh, and you, you could probably develop some sort of sensitivity experiments uh, in the absence of having the real data to, uh, to force the model to do that. But that, that would be my guess, three months. Uh, that's the maximum. And you would you'd see some sort of decline effect earlier on, but you would see that it depends on the vegetation. I mean, if you have short rooting vegetation, you see an effect earlier than you have a deep rooting uh, tropical rainforest. But I think even the tropical rainforest will be hit. Uh, if you have a, a three months, a two months period of drought. But it would be a nice follow up. Then. <laughs> Just towards the end, basically, the result of your. We have a constrained estimate of the DPET. Yeah. And then what are we going to do with this? Like, you can then look into the future, make a given amount, but can we maybe use it to improve the models? Can we, like, what are we going to do with this? With this estimate, then, what, it, this is what I, what I said. What we need to do is use the constraint to narrow the estimates of the current set of climate, the future prediction. But this is this is based on historical prediction. It shows that there is a relation, and we can constrain that. What we need to do is use models that go into the future, mm -hmm. and then use the similar approach to constrain the the, the, the the ensemble spread uh, of those models to a much smaller estimate. Assuming it's the same in the future than it was historically. Because mm -hmm. um, your constraint is. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. don't. We, do, we, we We sort of. We, we're not too worried in a way about what really causes this. We just. Got, we just established that there is a constraint. Or there is a relation. And that relation holds very well in the past. And even if this was 30 years of data, but if you use 100 years of data and you use different data sets, you find the same sort of relation. So that, that, it's a pretty robust uh, relationship. And unless anything changes dramatically, like for instance, suddenly the tropical rainforest starts feeling that there is too much CO2 in the air and it stops evaporating, then we, yeah, then we might run into problems. 
and it cannot really be used to improve the models in a way because you've not really figured out why that relationship is there. Like it's an, an observed no, relationship. No, you can't. You, you can't use it. Well, no. No. The, the, the only thing that you need to improve your model, you know, is um, is this point because that's the observation. But what you do here is you make use of the fact that you have an ensemble. And you don't really know which model is right and which model is wrong. But you use all the information of these models. But if you would do the sort of classic thing, you would say, well, this is what we find in the observation. So these three models are correct and the rest is bullshit. So that, that's, not, that's not the approach you take here. You assume that all models are equally valid. And you use the information that's contained in those models. I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Hanama. Thank you.